so I see a lot of engaging discussions have started, and I mean, uh, even though I mean we are all in the open source spirit, so it should be. It's how it should be. It's about collaboration, working together, talking to each other, learning from each other. Um, but still, it's always good to remind. Uh, now I will start. Thank you that you came um, and that you refreshed your minds now again to come in the conference mode again. Um, I'm Vivian Barnier. I'm leading the NXS Foundation and I will talk today about open innovations for energy access uh, because we believe it's a significantly underrepresented topic uh, around here. We want really to push it and to get um, the LF Energy and open source crowd in general to learn more about the potentials on leveraging open source for energy access and leveraging the experience from energy access for energy transition and uh, other open source projects in general. So let me start with a slide that at least people that are kind of related to energy access might uh, know. No, I have to do it that way. Um, that's a picture showing the globe by night, even though that's not really true because we don't have this situation ever where the whole world is at night. Um, but it's a compilation of different night times around the world and showing um, where you can see light emission in the night, which is a pretty good indicator to see where there's electricity. So no wondering that in the Sahara there's not much electricity you know, in the Amazonas, it's maybe pretty good and that there's not too much light in this area, particularly in the Amazonas. Um, but still looking for example at the African continent, you have here on the west coast some light points but also these areas are pretty densely populated. Or not directly densely populated, but there are a lot of people living there and a lot of these people actually don't have access to electricity. Um, yeah, that's the whole thing that we are talking about when we talk about energy access. We can also talk about energy in a broader sense, but talk, mainly talking about electricity today, um, which we can see pretty nice on this map. I just focused on the African continent here, but there are also other spaces uh, where this applies. Um, now, let's see what has happened for energy access over the last decade. Uh, we can see that there has been a, a very successful effort in reducing people that don't have access to electricity over the last decade. However, we also see that there was a stagnation over the last year and even what happened in 2022, there are more people without electricity than the year before in the world. Now, anybody has a good idea why this is or why that happened? Nobody? Population exactly. Population growth outperformed the efforts and investments in energy access. So we, are, we have connected new people here and no one has lost or very little people have lost electricity connections, but the population growth is faster than the electrification efforts. And as we know, this is a problem that is not likely to end very soon. Um, so there's a serious problem here. So we have a goal, which is the SDG 7, which actually very sadly is missing an entrance um, in the SDG 7 cubes, which are there in the corner. You might have seen, I was pretty obsessed now. All good, that, that it's not there. We actually made a picture like symbolizing the seven already um, to make it fit there and um, to, to show this in, in financial figures. Um, we had in 2019, unfortunately I haven't found a more recent figure, but we had a bit more than 10 uh, billion US dollar investment in energy access. However, to achieve this SDG 7, like affordable and clean energy for all by 2030, we would need three times that yearly. We see that the most of this would go to the African continent, a good part to Asia and, and the rest of the world, but the interesting figure is like we are at one third more or less of what we would need annually to flow in the sector. Um, now there are reasons why this is like that, why there is no money flowing in the energy access sector. Um, and this reason I want to point out um, to later make you understand where we see the particular value of open source in the sector. So as, as we can see, I mean, this is now one village which is actually electrified. You can see the power poles here, um, but this is like the typical setting, even though that typical setting doesn't exist, but um, this is one typical set setting of areas which are not electrified. So relatively sparsely populated, um, 
very remote uh, very often. Uh, so difficult to reach, so setting up infrastructure is not easy, maintaining infrastructure is not easy, and hence expensive. Um, we don't know how much energy people will use, and we don't know the total amount, we don't know when they will use it, like we don't know the patterns, we don't know the user's patterns. Uh, we have extreme weather conditions, like we have that in other parts of the world, but as I said, that's also remote, so if something happens, it takes you a long time to go there. Uh, you have extreme heat, you have tropical animals and plants that go into any inverter or whatever technology you have there. You have winds, you have rains. Um, you have issues with data connectivity if you want to go on uh, like remote uh, monitoring. Even though telecom is ahead of energy access, a lot of these areas have some data connectivity but don't have electricity yet but not all, so it's not a 100% reliable connection uh, you have with GSM or 2G or 4G. Um, and then regulatory uncertainty, there's main grid connection uh, extension that might sound strange because main grid extension would sound great because it brings electricity. However, if there is no certainty if it will happen or not, no private or private public partnership will engage in electrifying these areas with a decentralized system because they don't know, will actually the main grid come and so my investment will be worthless soon? Or will it not? And often straight energy planning foresee there will be electrification in five years. So no investor is putting money on the table, but this is not going to happen. And there's often no regulatory certainty that gives you the security, okay, if you do it and in 10 years the main grid comes, there will be some compensation and so on to make it attractive. So it's, a, it's basically they say we will electrify or we might electrify so nobody else does it, but in the end, nothing happens. So that's uh, what I mean by that as a risk to a good extension, even though it would be great. Um, now, with all that said, I, uh, the last thing which I didn't mention, the first point of the slide, these areas pretty often have very, very low income customers, meaning like all these challenges needs to be addressed, which results in extremely expensive electricity, or LCO, level of cost of electricity, or the price per kilowatt hour you, you need to pay, but you have on the other side customers that have very low income. So there's a mismatch between like the reality, what it does cost to produce this energy and on the ability to pay for it. Um, now we would need low cost solutions which still are resilient to be able to achieve the SDG 7. And we have actually a lot of actors that try to do it, which is great on the one side. I mean, we have non-profits, we have domestic SMEs from the countries themselves, sometimes from the villages themselves, they try to uh, do projects to electrify themselves. We have co community and cooperative driven uh, energy electrification models. We have large international utilities going in the space of decentralized energy. Um, selling solar home systems, so individual systems for also, but also doing mini grids. Um, we have the same from the domestic uh, utility sometimes going in that direction. And even agri industries are looking into that because they want to kind of ensure their value chain and their like logistics and need energy for that on site. So yeah, the variety of players try to address these challenges, which leads ultimately to the problem that a lot of this pro uh, uh, stakeholders at the end up reinventing the wheel constantly because the challenges are various, they need to be addressed, you need to develop a solution for them, but often they do it everybody on the side and come up with very similar solutions which don't make the competitive advantage or difference to the other ones, they are just the underlying necessary pain work that needs to be done and then a few tiny works might be the ones where they can say, oh, this is really the outstanding part of my business model, either in business model, technology, or so on. Um, but there is so much repetition, and in the sector, there is still a lot of public donor money which is used, partly equity as well, but mainly donor money which is constantly used to reinvent the wheel with individual solutions which should be shared uh, to, to make a more efficient sector. Um, I constantly keep on click on this one and I have to click here. Um, now th there's this one quote from uh, Oscar from Ocra Solar, which is one of the companies that we have worked with, um, which says, think about the scale of the problems we are trying to solve. Problem. Electrifying hundreds of millions of people in incredibly remote areas is never going to happen if it relies on traditional utility methods. 
we need to be smarter and use what technology has to offer if we are going to solve the problem. And I would even go beyond that. We need to jointly use and develop the technology that we can offer to solve the problem. Because obviously, technically, we need to use, but we need to develop and use it jointly. That's what I would like to, to add to this quote, even though Okra has developed an open source project with us. But um, yeah, I, I wanted to, to show this quote because it summarizes pretty greatly what, uh, what we stand for. Um, now, this means it goes all in this direction of this word that has been said several times this morning already, interoperability in the sector. No? And there I, I want to show to make it a bit more pragmatic what is actually what we do, what are the kind of projects that we support. And there's the open pay go token. Who is familiar with pay as you go as a model? Okay, some are. So let me quickly summarize. Pay as you go, as we said, as remote areas, low income customers. So and be able to purchase a relatively expensive asset um, for a solar system, for example, they can pay it on a pay-as-you-go basis. So basically, they pay a monthly fee or weekly fee and get a token that allow, unblocks uh, airtime. So for a month, for a week, or whatever they have paid for. And then over a certain period of time, they have paid off their system and it's transferred to them and it's completely unblocked. But if they don't pay and don't get a token, just stop working, even though the solar panel is there, and so it just doesn't, electricity doesn't come out. So that's just pay as you go in a, in a nutshell. Um, now you need this token, which I mentioned. Huh? You need somebody pay something, gets a token, and then enters via a keypad here to unblock its system. Um, now there were a lot of, or there are still a lot of token systems, and also in energy access, and there were a lot of different token systems from different uh, loan fraud from providers, which ended up manufacturers obliging to pre-configure the, the same hardware for different token systems. And that's where we engage together with Solaris Off-Grid to say, okay, develop one open peg or token protocol to decode, uh, to encode and decode uh, the information, and this can be used on the different platforms. And this ultimately drove to a sector-wide interoperability of this loan platform provider, which are, for example, Angaza, Pegi, and from there, went to at least, where we stopped counting, 15 to 20 manufacturers, which are now all using this uh, open Pago token and open Pago metrics, which significantly disrupted the sector and led to significant efficiencies in the sector. And that's exactly the kind of solutions where we believe the power of open source uh, is very important for this sector. Um, now, a few more details. I mean, as I said, it's an hardware and software agnostic technology that allows Pago uh, ability. Um, it's integrated with the mo most uh, Pago platforms. Um, and yeah, allows you to securely and remotely manage uh, and disconnect customers' assets um, if needed. Now, this is one of our flagship projects that has a, had a very sector-wide impact in uh, energy access. Now, let me tell a bit why we see what we do and this interoperability issue or topic is very important for energy access, but also for energy transition where we see the overlay. We have here this picture which stands for us for energy access and this for energy transition. Uh, and we don't believe only that we need interoperability within energy access. We also believe we need interoperability and transoperability between energy transition and energy access. There are so much developments done in energy transition which are very, could be very valuable for energy access and vice versa, but there's very little exchange in the open source space about these developments and how they are certainly not able to copy one-to-one, -one, but that's the great thing about open source. We all know we can tweak it, we can change it, we can modify it. Um, and we really believe we need to create much more links and exchange here and leverage all this experience which, create, which is existent in the open source space to overcome this like barrier which we can see here and make it overlap much more and work together. Um, no, I've said what we have done, what are the challenges in NAD access, but I also want to say how an access works and how does our process work. So we have this uh, old school image of a light bulb for an innovation. 
it's not innovative anymore today, but it was a great innovation and we still see a lot of light bulbs even though today there was, there was LEDs, but the concept's pretty much the same. Um, and how do we find or develop these innovations? So the one thing is, is in inbound, we do inbound and outbound identification, so we have a call where people can propose ideas to us. And the other one is we talk to the sector and identify the sector and try to understand what are the innovations that are needed. Either ways, in the next step, we involve in very uh, deep stakeholder consultations. So we talk to the different stakeholders in the sector. Uh, we have a community platform where we invite the sector stakeholders to provide feedback. And once we have a good co-designed project and say, okay, now we can develop it, we mainly step a bit back and let the developers develop and just provide some quality insurance both on, on, on the development itself and also on the, on the software, uh, on, the, on the documentation. And um, then during the process and afterwards we do like promotion and marketing where these like sounds we are trying to make it spread uh, out the world to the sector so the people know there are these innovations that you can use. And lastly, we also provide a library which is maintained with high quality open source innovations to be used by the sector and, provi and provide some initial adoption support. So companies with not much clue of how to do it and where to do it can come to us and we, pr we are there to provide the additional adoption support to see how to, to use the innovations that are actually available to use there. Um, now let me go into a few more, deta a few more examples of the innovations. Um, there's for example a hardware project, the open battery management system, so the ones that are pretty aware with energy access might say, okay, another battery management system, there are so many around already, proprietary, not proprietary and so on. However, we still see in the energy access sector companies developing their own battery management system from scratch, that's the problem. No? Obviously, your battery specifications or your application can be so specific that you need to tweak stuff, but that's the great thing. It's open source, no, we can't tweak it. And we really see a lot of companies in the sector constantly developing battery management systems. We said like, okay, that's a great idea. Uh, we funded uh, Liebel Solar, a German-based uh, company, developing this um, battery management system, which is suitable for 12 to 48 wall systems, up to 16 cells, which is actually quite a power. So you can operate a, like a little small machine with it already, not just a few light bulbs. And it comes with a variety of communications, CAN, serial, Bluetooth, and Wi-Fi, and has also connectors where you could connect GSM, LoRaWAN, or other user interfaces. And for gems for GSM, I will come to that later. We have also an open source module for that. Um, here you can have a bit of closer look on the ones that are into like tech and hardware development. Uh, happy to bring that up later in the Q&A if you have specific questions. Um, then as mentioned, it's all about connectivity, IoT or Internet of Everything, as uh, you also call it, not just of things. Um, and in energy access, we also have the same problem. Um, just that we have areas, or we had areas where a lot of one on 2G, but we were also forced looking, okay, it will be 4G at some point, 5G further in the future, or already today. Um, and again, there was no good solution on the market um, that responded in terms of price and functionality and sizing to what energy access companies needed. So Okra Solar, the company I mentioned earlier, came up to say, okay, we want to develop a uh, hardware and the related firmware um, for this communication module, for communication modules which come as Wi-Fi, 2G, 3G and 4G modules, depending on which country, because if you di operate in different countries and some 2G is already switched off, in the other ones it's still operating quite nicely. Um, yeah, and they developed this Cicada um, communication modules, which uh, are uh, agnostic from the platform and also you can easily customize it to different microcontrollers and operating systems. Um, here again you can see the Cicada module and which you can easily plug on whatever device you're using and which brings us to the last project which is an, oh, no, it's not our last project, the last example I brought you today, uh, the open smart meter. Um, smart metering is all around in energy transition but only also in energy access. Um, and again, there are 
smart meters available even for energy access, prepared for the energy access space. However, there are several companies that have and they are still developing their own smart meters because of costs, because they don't suit exactly their particular use case or whatsoever. Um, and these are companies that actually focus on electrifying people, on selling electricity. But then they end up developing a smart meter and 10 of them at the same time, not exchanging any information. And it's not their business to sell a smart meter, their business to sell electricity. So, and you are just there, why? 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 Again, no? And that's where we said, okay, we engaged with First Electric, a Nigerian-based company that developed a low-cost open smart meter, uh, which you can see here, which is actually, uh, which has all the basic functionality, it has a customizable API, can easily be integrated with um, like online platform for, for token generation, uh, has RS 232 and GSM communication, which actually comes with, again, and that's what we think so great, with the Cicada Wi-Fi module or the Cicada GSM module, which you just saw in the slide before. So we really try also to use the different pieces in our ecosystem and they, they work into each other. This is a prototype stage as the ones that are a bit into hardware development might see. That's a through hole design and manual soldering, which is obviously not suitable for mass manufacturing, but that's also, we really engage on early stage and also take risk in projects. We are happy to like take, okay, high potential and high risk projects where not all grow as big as we would like to, but the sector needs these initiatives and at least a lot of these learnings of what could be done and what you should not do uh, can be accessed and are accessed and used by the sector. Um, now, I'm coming to the end soon. We are here also today, the first time at LF Energy Summit, um, and pretty happy to be here to talk to you, to the LF Energy crowd and to the open source crowd and the energy transition and open energy transition crowd who want to build together. We want you guys to help with your building blocks and our building blocks working through energy transition and energy access and leveraging your experience to actually tackle these challenges that I mentioned before, like the remote areas, low income, regulatory uncertainties, extreme weather conditions, unknown load patterns, missing funds, and the misuse of funds. And we really want to stop this misuse of funds and just create a suitable open ecosystem of the basic tools that can be used and, and stimulate the sector. So I pretty much invite all of you to look at what we are doing come to us. There's also Clara, my colleague, and me, we are here, can talk to us. Um, and also if you have the other thousands or millions or billions too much and you want to fund energy access, come to us. We can help you a lot to make this very efficient and uh, yeah, make the best use of these funds to uh, really have a great leverage in creating energy access. And yeah, let me close with this. This is our great team. Uh, we are a remote team spread around the world. It's a bit exaggerated between the African continent and the European country, uh, continent in different countries. Um, that's more or less how we look like. Um, and would love to soon not have enough space on our slides anymore to uh, like put all the people that want to work with us. And yeah, you can contact us on info at nxs.org. You can follow us on LinkedIn. Uh, you can also talk to the two of us, as I mentioned, and check out our GitHub, um, where the projects that I mentioned and a lot of other projects that we have, also much more software-related projects are hosted. And we do not only do technology, software, and hardware. We also believe in business models and concepts. And it's also what we have developed. So let me close with that. Now there will be a Q&A session. Um, feel free to ask whatever. Feel free to criticize. We are pretty open to critics. And we want to use and leverage these critics. We think this is very important in what all of us do. And uh, when you have a question, I would appreciate you quickly say your name and who you represent, if you represent any. If you just represent yourself, also fine. And um, this helps a lot to, like, later know who has asked. So thank you for your attention.
It's a what? Mm-hmm. Uh, where we can bridge, uh, bridge that gap uh, to see uh, how Finnish people talk about the other side get to support, it, support one another and agree on what you do on that. It's one of the reasons why I'm here, basically. I would say I, I don't have the perfect roadmap now for that, but I, Dan already said we, we should talk, and I think we will do that. So, um, yeah. If, if you have great ideas or like uh, want to brainstorm, I'm more than happy. But yeah, I don't have a roadmap yet, but I hope we are doing the first steps towards that and, and happy to get as many of you to join us on this journey. And Ah, yeah. This, uh, we are currently funded by the Charles Stuart Mott Foundation and the Dune Foundation. This, I mean, grant money for now. So we are 100% grant funded so far. We are also in the transition to see this is possibly not forever. I mean, we will always see grant funds because we also want to provide funds. As I said, part of our work is not doing the development of our own, but like seeking the sector coming to us to say, we want to develop and we provide on the one side funds to do it. But now we are also extending our in-house support with our own team to, de uh, to the developments, also for some quality insurance issues and like guaranteeing maintenance and so on. But yeah, we, we have these two funders so far, but are obviously always uh, on the outreach to, uh, to new funders and also growing a bit like this service provision uh, around open source, the open source products and open source and developments in general. Um, but so far we are almost completely been in, on, in grant funds so far. And if you have some left over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, um, Max from Open Energy Precision. Um, so you mentioned a couple of names in, in the projects uh, and, and they were like mostly, like I think, coming from the EU. Uh, so are you working on your projects also with Africans uh, locally? Yeah. This is um, I mean, it's a very good point. We have in our portfolio, there are two companies that we have funded the First Electric, the ones that developed the smart meter. Um, it's a Nigerian-based company. And then there's another one which I didn't present here, which is Airlink, which is a Bluetooth relay extension of the internet, let's say. It's to, for non-connected areas where you have relatively small, uh, either not, uh, non-connected or you have very small devices and you don't want to spend 20 or 25 years on a GSM module, so you would go for Bluetooth, and it's like the phone acts as a data transition, and it's a Bluetooth-based uh, server also, uh, open source-based server structure, and the whole software around it. It's called Airlink, and it's developed by Tanzanian company Simo Solar. The others, correctly said, are Europe, or even across Australia-based companies um, that are active in this sector, uh, in, on this continent or in the sector. Uh, but yeah, we are pretty open. It's just from the proposition from, pro from project that we have received and the feedback from the sector, these are the ones that have crystallized as the most interesting project for the sector. But we actively try to push more like African or Asian based companies to also come out with it. Even though we are often observed there it's often a bit more resistance with the open source because, I mean, of stealing uh, information and knowledge which is locally created, which I can totally understand, like, historically thing, so that there's a bit more reason. But we are actually currently creating uh, much more bounds with the open source community Africa. Um, yeah, they are completely off of energy access, but we are just also trying to bring energy access and this open source community uh, together. Um, I mean, we're not focusing on it, and we, I mean, yeah, we, 
we try to focus on like bringing electricity to where there's not yet electricity instead of okay we decentralize and democratize the centralized systems which exist like for example in developed countries often um, however I agree that a lot of what we do could also be beneficial and vice versa again and it's actually a good interesting point and for me that comes a bit with energy transition no? this is I mean energy transition is not just we get rid of fossil fuels and put some solar panels it's much more also like transition in terms of using this decentralized renewable energies to also create energy communities um, and I mean historically to talk about energy communities and cooperatives large parts of the world have been electrified by energy cooperatives and the most prominent examples I don't know if you know which country it is the US US has been electrified through a cooperative model. Um, maybe not the most logical if you look at today's pol policies and politics, but um, so we, we really believe that, I mean, we, we, and that's why I said we see energy transition, like going back to cooperatives or decentralized energy as part of any transition and very happy to create and use more of these linkages and parallelisms. Yeah, I mean, this is something. That's very usable. Totally. What I can see from the specs you were talking about, I could probably use that in a home installation. Totally. Or if you're like a large, like between a bit bigger as an e bike, but smaller than a car. Um, and that's where from the specs it could fit. Yeah, I mean, this is these kind of innovations are ones that you can really use pretty widely. Um, tweaking them a bit, but it's always the idea. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, we, yeah, exactly. We give it to everybody and we, in our particular case, we want to stimulate people to use it and to even create and to particularly create business models that can be a profit or non-profit or non-for-profit business model. However, that they scale it in the use and that it reach, that it leads to electrifying people more efficiently instead of having 40 organizations doing the same time, the same thing on the same time all the time, using public donor money, which is the most like painful thing about all that. It's unnecessary destruction of money. Again? It's unnecessary destruction of money. Exactly. It can be used for other purposes. Yeah, totally. Exactly. We said that like 50, 60, 80 percent of these funds could go into actually creating a new connection yeah. instead of developing another smart need or another battery management system. <laughs> yeah, I think we're done. I have two minutes left, but I think just, oh, there's one more question. I mean, <laughs> it's difficult to say. I mean, the one thing which I showcased is the open Pago token, uh, definitely in terms of how it disrupted and led to really a sector-wide interoperability across several stakeholders and by that saves significant amount of money. And the other one which I didn't mention here, um, it's a DREC initiative where we came in as a very early stage funder. It's a decentralized renewable energy certificates. This is possibly a problematic uh, topic to discuss about if we believe in RECs or not. However, it's happening and it's only hap or it has happened a lot only for large systems while decentralized systems were completely not accessing they have a big need of getting more funds and they were completely off of accessing this tool it's not large amounts of money you get for a kilowatt hour which comes of solar energy but at least it's a few cents and the DREC initiative provides the infrastructure to bundle like this very small amounts of energy distrib distributed energy and converts them in an IREC like works jointly with the IREC platform and then can be actually sold to somebody to offset the en uh, renewable energy in the excess, uh, to the fossil, to offset fossil re uh, energy production with renewable energy production, but with an additional impact because it's actually creating new energy for people. Now this, we, I don't want to open the discussion if this general trade of offset is great or not. Um, this is another political topic, we, we can, can discuss this aside, but I think this is also pretty successful in terms of it has grown, it has been taken up, it's now being a new own organization and there have been significant new flows of money creating new connections 
to people who didn't have energy access before. So I think these are the two, but a lot of the others one as well. And I, I heard there was a discussion about metrics and impact. We face the same challenge. Often we don't know. We can see how many people have downloaded on our GitHub. Obviously we can see in some there's not much contribution, but we can see there were a lot of downloads, but who knows, are you using it? Have they used it? Has that saved money for them or time? I don't know. I <laughs> so maybe there's another project which was more successful, we just don't know. So, um, but if you have great ideas how to measure it, we are here. <laughs> now I think it's really 40 minutes uh, and I noticed that you are very precise on the timekeeping here. So I will do my contribution and end my presentation here. Thank you so much for being here and for this engaging discussion.